As we begin this, this lesson, it is taken from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 14. And it is familiar to us, and we know it as Jesus walking on water. And yet we have often a limited understanding of the story as a whole. Why? Because we tend to know some details, but not the whole scope. And I'm here to tell you that there is no way that you can have the whole scope of the story of Jesus on walking on water only from one gospel. Like I mentioned you before, every one of the gospels, we have four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every one of them is a tool for different projects. Matthew, Matthew talks and speaks directly to those of Jewish descent and those of Jewish faith, those who know the law very well. Mark talks to Gentiles. Luke talks to those who need evidence. John talks to no who feel more of the presence of God. The story that we're going to consider today is found in three out of the four. We're going to read Matthew 14, but just so you know, We're also going to be paying attention to Mark 6 and John 6 to have a really good understanding of the story as a whole because it might shatter whatever views or whatever understanding you think you knew. You only know half of the story. It's like yesterday I was doing that wedding that I mentioned to you, and I arrived early, and I was able to sit down in a restaurant, rehearse whatever it is that I was going to say and all that, and then I got to the beach, and when I got to the beach, I realized that law enforcement had not courted the area of the beach that the couple had to pay for. So everybody was at this particular place because it's a beautiful part of the beach. So guess what we had to do? The groom had to do. He had to call the sheriff department to keep people out, out of the beach, so that they could have their wedding, which they pay for. Not only that, but the guy with the drone didn't show up. And grandma, they come from Venezuela, the young couple, they are not really connected to us. It's people that I met in Orlando, and they wanted a minister who was able to speak English and Spanish fluently. And the couple comes from Venezuela, and the couple is a young couple in their early 20s. And um, the grandma of the bride, she had these coins, and their, their, their faith is Catholic. And in their faith Catholic, they have these coins that you give to the couple from generation to generation. This has been passed down in four generations in their family. And you give it as a ritual to show, um, you know, generosity to the couple. They call it the first gifts. And grandma forgot them. She asked me, can we still do the wedding? Of course we can. Yes. By the end of the day, you and Isaac will be married. But after the kiss, I warn you, walk away from Isaac because he's going to try to throw you in in the ocean. And I told Isaac, do not do that. I cannot do weddings and divorce right away. Right? And he didn't do it, thankfully. But... I told her, yes, wedding is possible. However, one of the invited guests show up like five minutes after the bride came in. And that particular guest didn't have any idea of what happened before. He just thought it was a very brief wedding, 25 minutes. Sure. And this is what happens with the Gospels. There are different point of views. And if you want to have a really holistic understanding, you have to know what all of the Gospels say in reference to a particular story. So let us begin with Matthew 14. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. While he sent the people home, After sending them home, he went up in the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. 
Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. For a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Jesus said, why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. To God be the glory. This is the word inspired by God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. It is odd that the first thing that you read from Matthew 14, verse 22, is that Jesus did what? Immediately after this, what was happening before was Jesus feeding the 5,000. Immediately after Jesus feeding the 5,000 in the afternoon, Jesus insisted that the disciples get back in the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. If you read only Matthew, you will see that Jesus insisted that they get in the boat and that they go into the lake and what did they find in the lake? Storm. Did Jesus really rush them to get in the boat so that they could get into the middle of the storm? If you read Matthew, that might be one of your conclusions, right? Right? right. Yeah. However, with the help of Mark and John, your understanding can get enhanced. Yes, it is true that in Matthew 14 and Mark 6, Jesus insists that the disciples get back into the boat. However, only after reading John 6, you can see that Jesus was rushing the disciples only because people wanted to force Jesus to become their king. Now you have a better understanding as to why Jesus was rushing the disciples. But then, if you read John 6, it tells you that Jesus simply slipped away into the hills. And that's not very Christ-like. Have you ever been in a party, and you feel that you must and you should just slip away without saying goodbye? More importantly, have you ever been the host of a party, and you have your friends not saying goodbye and leaving your party? Either way, it doesn't feel that nice. Sleeping away without saying goodbye, leaving, having people leave without saying goodbye to you, it's not a nice feeling to have. It's not very Christ-like. So obviously, you cannot only read John 6 because it tells you that Jesus slipped. If you read Mark 6 and Matthew 14, you will see that in Mark 6, Jesus says goodbye. And not only more purposefully, Matthew tells you that Jesus sent people to their home. Just like I will send you home at the end of this service with the charge for you to share that which you received today with your family. It's important that when you come and receive, because I know that you will receive something, you go home to your neighbors, to the extended family, and that you share that which you learn today. That's why it's important to know what John says, what Mark says, and what Matthew says. And this is the Jesus we have learned to adore and praise. Jesus that cares for the people. Jesus that says goodbye. Jesus that sent people home. But Mario, what about the disciples? Right? What about the disciples? If you continue reading, 
Matthew 14 and Mark 6, you will know that the disciples were in trouble, far from the land, fighting a strong wind that had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Mark tells you that it was late at night, and the disciples were in this boat, in their boat, a fishing boat, in the middle of a lake, in the middle of a storm. Poor disciples, you might say. Christ rushed them to the boat, and Christ, all-knowing, because Christ is all-knowing, right? Right? Christ, who knows it all, most likely was aware of the storm happening. How unfair, you might say. And this is where you have to read John 6, 17. It says, But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake towards Capernaum. That means that the disciples were not obedient. When Jesus was done feeding the people and the 5,000, it was mid-afternoon. Jesus tells them both in Matthew and Mark to go and cross the lake right now. But what did the disciples do? They decided that they knew better. And they decided to stay at the shore waiting for Jesus. And when they saw that Jesus was not coming back is when they decided in the middle of the night to jump into a boat and cross the lake. And I'm no expert in boating, but I know that boating in the middle of the night might not be a good idea. Right? 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 Now the disciples have to confront something that in John is called the gale. Now, I don't know what the gale is, so I had to Google it. But the gale is a wind that goes from 39 to 54 miles per hour in a fishing boat, like a canoe made of wood, basically. In Mark 6, it tells you that Jesus saw that the disciples were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. This proves you that faith, by faith, through faith, because of faith, not only you have to pray to God, but also you have to row towards the shore. What happens if you only trust God and do nothing? You will drown. What happens if you row without trusting God? You will go in circles. That's why you have to pray to God and row towards shore. You have to do both as hard as you can. So what did Christ do after seeing the disciples struggling? Thoughts and prayers? What does Jesus do? Helicopter God comes to the rescue, saving them from all? Or Jesus says, well, I told you to leave early. Now you're in the middle of a storm. You deal with it. Sounds like you problem." Consequences, consequences. What did Christ do? Thoughts and prayers? Come to the rescue? Or just let us deal with consequences? At just the right time, they had row for three or four miles, according to John. At three o'clock in the morning, Matthew 14 and Mark 6, Three things happen according to the disciples. Matthew 14 tells you that Jesus went towards them. John 6 tells you that Jesus was, was walking towards the boat. However, Mark 6 tells you that Jesus intended to go past them. <laughs> this, you cannot make up. How is it possible that the disciples understood three things? that Jesus was walking towards them, that Jesus was going to the boat, towards the boat, or that he intended to pass them. Here's why. First thing, Jesus, the disciples, the Bible, the scripture tells us that the disciples were terrified. That means that their purview, their vision is not that good to make a judgment call. This is why, and here's a baseball analogy, because, you know, there needs to be a baseball analogy. When you see the umpire, and the umpire is going to make a call from the base, you see them rushing, 
and stop before the play happens so that their view stops moving. When you are running, if you're a runner, you know that your view goes like this. So when you're rushing, you stop and you make a judgment call before the plays happen. When you are terrified, your heart, your mind, your spirit, everything in your body goes like this. When you are terrified, it's not a good idea for you to make decisions or make a judgment call. You have to still. At the wedding yesterday, as the bride is, is, is giving her vows, she is crying. It happens more than you think. And here's where the pastor has to have enough insight that you carry one for you to, because it's hot in the middle of the beach and you're doing this, but you have one in your pocket that is dry, crispy, and clean. And the one that you can give to her. Why? Because the groom never thinks about it. He's sweating. He doesn't know what to do. So you're the one that has to come and give it to her and says, hey, it's okay. And that's when she does it and continues. Oh, more than you think. In fact, when there's a wedding happening, what I like to do is to look at his face. Everybody's memorized with the bride, but I look at the guy and says, man, the beauty and the beast, truly. And they are just sweating hands. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to stand. They're like, what am I doing? It happens. But this is where the person with authority, with knowledge, has to come in. person that is able to be calm and to say, it's okay. Now, in the same way, if you have ever cried. Last time I cried when, when I heard the news of my, uh, of my, um, of my grandma dying. And I was driving from church because my family waited. My grandma died on a Sunday morning. And my family waited to call me so that they wouldn't tell me in the middle of a service. So they call me. As I'm driving home, I have to pull over. Why? Because when you're crying, you can't drive. You can't see things straight. So you have to pull over and cry. So if you're a disciple of Christ, and you're in the middle of a storm, and you're terrified, and you're crying, you don't really have a good view of what Jesus is doing. Some of you might think that Jesus is walking towards you. Some of you might see or think that he's just paying attention to the situation, the boat. Or you might think that Jesus is just going to pass you, not even care about you. Settle down. That's the first thing that you must do. This is why Jesus spoke at once. Stop it, basically. Matthew 14, Mark 6. In John 6, it tells you he called out to them. However, it doesn't matter which one you read, whether it's Matthew, Mark, or John, they are three words that Jesus says in all of them. I am here. That's the one thing that all of them have in common. I am here. And this is not unique to Jesus, because I'm here to tell you that Jesus, all of the time, in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your storm, Jesus is saying, I am here, but you are so busy paying attention to the storm, paying attention to the boat, paying attention to the fact that you do not see God, even though God is right there in front of you. That's why Jesus, I have to say, I am here. So get a hold of yourself, because Jesus is here. Now, if you pay attention to Matthew, Matthew tells you the story of Peter. But he's the only one that tells you the story of Peter. Because Matthew is about Jewish people and their personal relationship with Jesus, and how they must stop paying attention to the law and start paying attention to the presence of Jesus. So Matthew tells you, about the importance of having a personal relationship with Jesus. However, Mark tells you, not the story of Peter, but the story from the perspective of all the disciples inside of the boat. However, John 
John doesn't care about the storm, the boat, or whatever. John says that the minute that Jesus approached, they were eager for Jesus to get in the boat. And the minute that Jesus gets in the boat, you know what happens? They arrive to the destination like a magic trick. If you read John, you will see that the minute that Jesus is inside of the boat, the boat is in many ways already in the right destination. No explanation given. How? doesn't matter. They are there at the right place. That means, and that tells you, if you're preaching from John, is that when Jesus approaches to a situation and, he, and you allow him to enter in that situation, you are at the place where you need it to be. And if we were Pentecostals at this moment, you would be jumping and saying hallelujah. Because this is, can you imagine that in the middle of the storm and Jesus enters in the situation, you say, I am where I need to be. Whether it's perfect or not, I am where I'm supposed to be. Hallelujah. As a church, as a congregation of faith, we have both a vision and a mission. Our vision says that we are to reflect and reveal the unselfish love of Christ in all that we do. Our mission says, when you know Jesus, you show Jesus. That is both our mission and our vision, our vision and our mission in ones. To reflect and reveal the unselfish love of Christ in all that we do. When you know Jesus, you show Jesus. How can we manage to, sh to show that unselfish love? So let me step away from teaching you into preaching. There's a difference. Teaching is about moving information and making you aware of things that you were not aware of. That's teaching. Preaching is connecting the gospel to your heart and make you do something about it. Because it's not enough teaching, you have to have preaching. Preaching is how you put it into practice that which you heard. So let us go into preaching mode. There is two things that the gospel tells us in Mark, Matthew, and John in reference to this story of Jesus walking on water. The first one is that as people of faith, we must give a greater priority to the needs of others, especially those outside of your circle. That's what Jesus does. Jesus is feeding the 5,000. Tell the disciples, you need to go, cross. I will meet you there. Jesus is paying attention to not his inner circle, but the others. Jesus gives greater priority to them. And as Jesus is praying, has that intimate relationship with God, he realizes that the disciples are in trouble. So he walks away from that relationship that he has with God in prayer and goes and takes care of if the first circle is the disciples and the people, the second circle is the relationship of Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit and the disciples. So Jesus walks away from this relationship and to pay attention to the disciples who are in trouble. So the first thing that you must know to reflect and reveal the unselfish love of Christ in all that you do, the first thing that you must do is to pay and give greater priority to those who are outside of your circle. The second of all is be present because you will be the deciding factor. You will be the person who says, it doesn't matter if the drunk guy didn't show up. It doesn't matter if those little coins are not there. You are going to get married today. You can enter with such authority in every situation that happens in your life and in the life of your family. So if the first one is to pay attention to those outside of the circle, you, with your presence, you can say, I am here. And perhaps it's to pray, perhaps it's to help row, perhaps it's to climb in, because if one thing happens in all three Gospels, nobody helps Jesus to get in the boat. Can you imagine that? Have you ever seen that? It doesn't matter whether you read Matthew, Mark, or John, nobody helps Jesus to get in the boat. 
In one, Jesus climbs in. In the other one, Jesus just appears inside of the boat. But nobody thinks about helping. Hey, Jesus, come here. So sometimes when you are present, sometimes your presence will be only for prayer. Perhaps you will pray and row. Perhaps you will have to climb in in a situation. And sometimes you're the one that allows everybody to arrive to that destination. The unselfish activity that we ought to model is to give greater priority to others, especially those outside of your circle, and be present. Be present in the midst of it all. The best thing that you can do when a friend is in trouble is to show up. I'm here. Don't be afraid of saying that. Not in the, ta-da, I'm here. No, in the, what can I do? See, we're talking about pastoral care, and you know that somebody died in the family. Show up, I am here. And show up with food or ready to do the dishes. But show up, I'm here. You have that authority. You have that power. You have that job, to be the one that shows up. Amen.